Hi, welcome to the EuroBSDCon talk on transport layer security. I'm Michael Lucas. I'll be recording this talk so that it can be delivered best, but I'll be live to take questions afterwards. So what's in this talk? TLS is huge, so I'm only going to touch on basic core that you need to know today. An overview of TLS, how certificates work, how they're revoked and invalidated, how CSRs should be handled today, and ACME. Mostly we'll be focusing on web servers. This talk is based on OpenSSL 111 or LibreSSL, and I tried a, a few different platforms with all of those. There is a newer OpenSSL just now, but rule one of OpenSSL is do not break the command line, so everything should keep working. TLS is often thought of as web server security, and that's true as far as it goes, but there's a whole bunch of security things that TLS simply doesn't do. TLS does not add security. It doesn't block intruders. It doesn't keep credit cards secret. And it doesn't stop password theft. What it does do is it encrypts traffic between clients and servers. It identifies servers, clients, or both. That's it. Nothing more. Now, TLS has been around for over a quarter century now, and it's gone through several revisions, mostly illustrating that any cryptographic protocol developed in-house will fail. Netscape wanted the web to become an e-commerce platform that meant it ne needed transport layer security. So they developed this thing called Secure Sockets Layer in-house. Once it was exposed to the real world, uh, they hurried up and rushed out version 2 and then version 3. And succeeding versions followed a little more slowly. And we've been on TLS 1.2 since 2008 or so. More than one cryptography expert told me that TLS 1.3 is the first version that wasn't rushed and has a proper cryptographic design. Now, when we're working on the internet, very often we fall back on Postel's robustness principle, which is to be conservative in what you send and liberal in what you accept. This means you may have web servers that offer old versions of HTTP. You may have a database engine with an older query support. SMTP, so long as you're not allowing and relaying spam, you can pretty much get mail through. Older versions of DNS still work. Um, and the fact that we can do this is glorious, and it is one of the Internet's advantages that let us have the world we've built. The robustness principle does not apply to TLS. There's something called a downgrade attack. If I can get, say, between you and Amazon and convince Bezos to speak to your client using SSL version 3, I can capture and decrypt all the traffic you, the two of you exchange. This gives me your username, password, and credit card numbers. Or I could change information in transit to completely alter your order or direct you to my website instead. You must disable and refuse to accept weak encryption. What does weak encryption mean? Well, all versions of TLS except 1.2 and 1.3 are known to be breakable and are officially deprecated. Supporting older versions of TLS or worse SSL th threatens the integrity of your network. 
And then in early 2021, the U.S. National Security Agency strongly discouraged many common TLS 1.2 configurations. And the NSA has this distressing tendency to predict future cryptographic attacks. Now, we cannot disable TLS 1.2 on the general internet yet. Uh, for one thing, there is no FIPS compliant TLS 1.3 browser. And if, if your site is meant to be accessible from uh, environments the US government considers secure, you're stuck on TLS 1.2. Um, I'm sorry, Mr. Postel, we still love you, but TLS is one of those examples that demonstrates the, the limits of the robustness principle. Now, there's a couple things I, I want to make a point about cryptography. It's a very specialized skill with many pieces, and there are very few sysadmins or SREs who really understand it. Cryptography is a great hobby with lots of math. If you're not doing the calculations and studying the innards of the algorithms, you don't really have an opinion on what works and what doesn't. Maybe you're parroting someone else's opinion. Uh, people like me, we have no choice but to trust the cryptographers or a standards body like FIPS. Uh, this is why FIPS and similar standards exist. Uh, I strongly discourage almost everyone from hand tuning ciphers and algorithms because we're not equipped. A key part of modern sysadmin skill is admitting what you don't know and don't engage in occult cryptic IT. Really what we need to know is protect your private keys, revoke your certificates at any excuse, and to use OpenSSL's high cipher list. Now, the key problem of cryptography is deciding who to trust. We generally have two trust models, the web of trust that you see in PGP and certificate authorities. The web of trust requires educated users, which immediately rules out the general public. Certificate authorities are easiest for users. TLS is about end users. That's what it uses. A CA verifies the identity of people, hosts, and organizations. Each has a trust anchor certificate of its own, and it uses that certificate to issue certificates for hosts and users, declaring that we have audited this person and or this server and they are who they claim to be. And client software comes with a bunch of anchor, trust anchors that it trusts to sign other people's certificates. There are six major trust anchor bundles, Microsoft, Apple, Google, Mozilla, Adobe, and Oracle. Now, different software uses different trust anchor bundles. And not all certificate authorities are in all trust bundles. Let's look at what comes with OpenSSL SSL for an example. The trust bundle is installed per install and per Unix. If you are using FreeBSD versus CentOS, the trust bundle you get may be slightly different. Most Unixes use the Mozilla bundle. One important thing is every operating system has its own way to manage the certificates in its trust bundle. Always read the documentation because if you just dump a, a certificate you want to trust in the directory, it'll get overwritten by an upgrade. Now there is an OpenSSL-CA file option that lets you trust a particular search in a particular command if you're testing. Now, anytime we talk about trust bundles, there's an overriding question of who are these people? If I look at the Mozilla bundle, there are entities there like the Shanghai Electric Electronic Certification Authority. Who is that? Do I need to trust them? 
Should I trust all these governments? Uh, they need us to trust them, but do we need to trust them? This is the ultimate question of the certificate authority model. I'm not going to belabor it any further in this talk, but it, it is a legitimate concern. So how are these certificates used through something called the chain of trust? Here we have a very simple chain of trust. There is a company called Gilder that we trust their root certificate and they have signed my certificate. This is the document, this is the diagram you will find dating back to the 1990s. It's very simple and I'm only in it's very obsolete. I'm including it simply to say certificate validation is finding a path between the certificate and a trust anchor. What's a little more realistic now is something like this where the root CA has its certificate and it's signed an intermediate certificate and that intermediate certificate in turn signs yours. Now if you're running an application, your application must provide the intermediate CA certificate. It's often called a chain file. Without that, your application will error. What's a little more realistic now is this tree of trust where you have multiple CAs signing multiple intermediate certificates so that if any one of the certificates further up the chain is revoked, declared invalid, or cannot be verified, you still have a viable chain of trust between a trust anchor and down to your certificate. If you have this, you must include both intermediate certificates. And this is where software often goes wrong. Uh, OpenSSL not long ago imploded when a trust anchor expired and it couldn't validate the other route. And it gets more complicated than that. Sometimes you have trust anchors, sometimes you have intermediate certificates that get promoted to trust anchors. Your software must always be updated forever. So, how, how would you use OpenSSL. It, it's the foundational TLS toolkit of, of the internet and it gets lots of flack for being complicated. The problem is it's complicated because cryptography is complicated. This is hard stuff. So basically you run OpenSSL, some subcommand, and then options for it. The subcommand sets the feature you're using. Options configure your task. For example, uh, we've all troubleshot a problem by using Telnet or Netcat to connect to a port. It's a vital skill. It doesn't work well on a TLS protected port because we can't decrypt it by hand. But you can use OpenSSL's S client and connect to a port and talk to it. Here, my web server uh, has a redirect. I wanted to be sure it was still in place, but web browsers cache stuff even when you want them not to. So I used OpenSSLS client to connect to that port and make sure that the redirect was still in place. So let's touch on certificates quick. TLS certificates are really X.509 certificates. This is the ITU's standard for digital identity certificates. It's built on ASN1, which is the standard used by SNMP and telecom firms. This is the same object tree as those protocols use, just a different part, except when they steal from each other. You don't really need to know ASN1 except to recognize when you see a stream of numbers that this is a bit of ASN1 your software doesn't know. Certificates also pillage the X.500 standard that you see from LDAP, and that's where you get these labels for parts of identifying information. Every label has an ASN1 identifier. 
and certificates expire usually every year or every 90 days. A certificate has assorted components. The certificate signing request or the CR, CSR is a form basically, please sign me, that you send to the CA. And once you have the certificate, the CSR is irrelevant. It includes your public key and it comes with a private key file. The private key is the secret for your certificate. Whoever has that can pretend to be you. Uh, the certificate file is a signed extract from the CSR that the CA sends back to you. And you combine the certificate with the private key to authenticate. Whatever happens, protect your private key. Now certificates can come in a few different validation levels. Domain validated means that the CA verifies that the requester controls the host. And then there's organization validated and extended validation that perform deeper audits. To most of us, the important thing is all of them provide the browser lock icon. Do you need one of the higher validation levels? Only if you are a bank or financial institution that is bound by regulations to do so. Certificates have a couple different algorithms these days. Uh, there's RSA, the older standard we all know and presumably love. 2048 bits is the current standard. It's been around for a long time and it's we know it's pretty solid. ECDSA is a newer standard. It does not use key length but instead uses named elliptic curves. It's roughly as strong as RSA, we think, but it requires less computing to validate. It's also not been around as long and hasn't earned the same trust. In general, use ECDSA if you are targeting mobile devices. Now, let's talk about common names. They are the most widely recognized part of a certificate. It could be an email address, a user ID, first and last name, a device serial number. Up until the year 2000, CN was used to store host names. This is now deprecated and I suspect many of you don't know that. Uh, it's incorrect. Despite that, some software expects to find a host name in the CN. People are working to actively exterminate this. If you are using or looking for or inserting host names in CN deliberately for your application, please stop. And why? A CN can have a maximum of 63 characters. Host names can be longer than that. I mean, I have this domain. You keep using that word. I do not think it means what you think it means, dot com. Uh, there is no way I can get www dot, dot that domain name in a certificate. The use of host names in CN is holding back improvements to TLS. The common name is not checked against restraints. Uh, and those constraints are important as we'll uh, see a couple of them. And the replacement is called a server alternative name or SAN. Now you can view the contents of a certificate, uh, including the certificate chain, identified entities, extensions, and so on, uh, such as those certificate subject alternative names. Uh, here I've deliberately pulled them out of a certificate and there are a few of the domain names on my uh, X509 cert for my site. There's also a nifty thing called a wildcard certificate where you can put the certificate on any host in your domain or subdomain. That sounds great except you must put the private key on all the hosts. If one host is compromised, everything is compromised. And if your intruder is sneaky, you will never know. The save is used is for stuff like DevOps where you're constantly deploying and removing machines in this dynamic cloud environment. Uh, I don't do that, thankfully. 
but that is where people sensibly use these. Now, we, uh, uh, yes, we still have time, we're still recording. Uh, revoking certificate, if you think your certificate is compromised, if someone has stolen the private key, if you think someone has stolen the private key, revoke the certificate. The certificate authority lets all the clients know by two different ways. One is certificate revocation lists and the other is the online certificate status protocol. Um, if your certificate authority offers revocation insurance, as in they'll give you a new cert for free if the old one is compromised, or if you're using Acme with one of the free CAs, revoke on any suspicion. Now, Firefox and Safari distribute lists of revoked certificates to their clients. And Chrome filters the revocation list Chrome users see. Uh, I run a small business. I revoked my certificate. Chrome users did not see it. If your business is in a country that Google doesn't pay much attention to, you must assume that Chrome users will not see the revocation either. Uh, protect that private key. Now, the certificate authority list that they distribute, uh, uh, this file contains a serial number of all unexpired revoked certificate, the certificate revocation list or CRL. The difference between that and the online certificate status protocol is that OCSP lets you check one certificate at a time rather than downloading a whole list. And OCSP has this neat feature where it provides a certificate of validity. It says for the next seven days, this certificate is definitely valid. Now your web server can staple that to its certificate that it serves clients. And this staple is the fastest way to optimize TLS connections for your clients. So if Chrome ignores a bunch of revocations. Uh, Firefox and Safari get rev revocations when the vendor gets around to it. H how do you best secure your environment? Well, the simplest way is a short-lived certificate. You can get a name constraint certificate that lets your organization sign certificates in its own domain. And you could give those certificates an expiration date of like five days and just deploy them through your automation regularly. There's something called Dane, which puts key uh, certificate key fingerprints into DNS. Uh, that's popular in email, not so much on the web. You can yell at your vendors, <clears throat> Chrome, and tell them to fix their revocation model. You can deploy browsers or forks of browsers that enable secure features. You can store private keys in hardware security modules. But this is the big problem with TLS right now. Even as it's become more common, it's gotten harder to revoke a certificate. So how do you get a certificate? You create one of those certificate signing requests, CSRs we talked about, and they contain all the information that the CA must validate. Now OpenSSL provides a friendly dialogue that gives you a CSR. You've probably all seen this and it puts the host name in CN. It supports only one host name. This script has technically been obsolete since 2000 and people are still writing tutorials using it. They're really trying to kill it. Don't use it. Use a configuration file to, to create your CSR or generate it wholly on the command line. It's not that hard. Now, it's possible to reuse your previous year's CSR to renew your certificate. This is horrible practice. The CSR is tied to a private key. Are you certain that that key did not leak? Um, 
have the key standards changed since last year? The CSRs are free. They can be scripted. Uh, every BSD has worked hard on their random number generator. Don't waste that effort. And we are not so close to the heat death of the universe that entropy is a limited resource. Make a new CSR and a new private key every year. Information that goes in your CSR includes uh, what you want to validate. If you're getting a DV search, you only need host names. All the organization information only needs to be there if you are getting a higher validation level. You put all of this information in using X.500. And before you start, gather the official names. It's easier to find out the formal name of your company before the audit than after. And you create a configuration file much like this. This is for a DV certificate, so the only things in it uh, are host names. I also set the number of bits and key file names. Uh, some software chokes on a certificate without a CN, so I do put one in here, uh, but the real list is under alt names at the bottom. And you run a comparatively straightforward OpenSSL command to generate the key. And this gives you a file with the CSR and a private key uh, as set in the configuration file. Now the hot new thing in TLS is Acme which people all know as free certificates. As someone who paid a hundred dollars for a certificate in 1996, this was a big deal. Now, Let's Encrypt certificates expire every 90 days. This is to encourage automation. And Acme basically works by verifying who controls the host or if you prefer, who controls the DNS of the host. And this is a automated process where the client uh, asks for a certificate, the, the CA sends back a change to be made to, to demonstrate control of the host. The client makes the change and the CA acknowledges it and accepts the CSR and boom, you get your certificate. There are three kinds of ACME challenges. Uh, HTTP 01 is put a file with this content on your web server. DNS 01 makes a change in the DNS. And ALPN 01 makes this change in a TLS protocol itself. Which should you use? Uh, for a single server, HTTP 01. If you want a wildcard cert, most CAs make you use DNS01. And if you're using load balancers, etc., ALPN01 is your friend. When do you renew these certs? About two thirds of the way through the lifetime. This gives you four weeks to resolve any transient issues. You can schedule it in cron to run weekly. And most clients handle this just fine. Now, there's a bunch of Acme clients out there. One of my favorites is OpenBSDs. It's clean, it's simple, it just works. It's also hooked in with uh, LibreSSL and that makes it a little difficult to get across some other Unixes. Uh, my favorite cross-platform one is Dehydrated and it's simple enough it runs on a Raspberry Pi without trouble. Now one of the problems of TLS is you can set it up and it looks like it works, but you can miss that you have bad stuff enabled very easily. SSL Labs provides a free public X, uh, TLS checker. Now the, the catch with SSL Labs is it only works on public websites and tests might set off intrusion detection. So if you're in a very secure environment, uh, check with your security staff before testing your web server. If you want to run such tests privately, test SSL.sh 
works beautifully, not as pretty, gets you the information. Now I'm almost out of the time I set for recording, so I'm going to touch on a few different topics quick. If you do nothing else after this talk, get your web servers up to TLS 1.2 and 1.3 only. There are other features then you can look at. Uh, HSTS lets your web server declare to clients that this web server only speaks HTTPS and should never speak unencrypted HTTP. That will help those clients evade downgrade attacks. CAA records are DNS entries that let your organization dictate which CAs may issue certificates for your domain. Certificate transparency lets you see who's issued certs for your domain. If you want to see what goes wrong with TLS, badssl.com gives you all kinds of sample failures that you can test your clients against. And finally, there are name constraint CAs, which let you sign certs for your own domain. If you are if you are subject to regulatory requirements and you need a whole bunch of certificates, running your own CA and getting a name constraint CA certificate may save you a lot of money and a lot of outside headache. So that is the end of the recorded part of the talk. TLS is huge, but I'm sticking around for any sysadmin level questions. And of course, there is my book, TLS Mastery, that is out. Thank you for sitting through this, and please say hello. Howdy, folks. If any, any questions, uh, I think we can probably read the, the chat, or <clears throat> probably we can unmute people as well. Yeah, people are talking about acme.sh. Uh, they're, they're not really transparent with some of their decisions, which kind of discouraged me from using them. You mentioned um, uh, uh, TLS testing sites. Uh, one, one site that I've been uh, quite fond of is hardenize.com. It runs a uh, large number of tests on whatever domain you, you feed it. Oh, uh, I've not heard of that one. So um, I think it's free. F um, um, I, th th I think it's a free free service, uh, but if the uh, if you want to run a number of tests on your own domains, uh, you need to to uh, register. I think. But it's, uh, but it's actually, actually quite, quite useful. Uh, it even uh, dis dissects your um, TLS for uh, SMTP uh, configurations and point out errors to mm. it. <laughs> so. Yes, that would be useful. In general, like anything else, uh, you want multiple testing tools from multiple providers because no one of them is complete. Yes, there's a test SSL dot S8. Sorry, Morgan asked, are there any comprehensive testing tools which are not a web service? Test SSL dot SH. It, it is a shell script. It provides everything that's in SSL labs. It is, uh, uh, it's perfectly fine. And it, it's all command line. How could I talk about running my own CA? We don't have many questions here yet, so I'll, I'll give a, a, a quick bit on that. Running your own CA is one of those things I recommend, like building your own firewall at home. 
everybody should do it at least once. You will learn a huge amount by doing it. Then uh, you can start by using uh, OpenSSL has a CA command that is perfectly fine for educational use, but is not suited for production or for exposure to the internet. Uh, it even includes things like an OCSP responder, which uh, is, is very educational to, to run in debug mode and see exactly what happens in those conversations. Uh, if you are looking at running a CA in your company's production environment, uh, then you really want a, a better toolkit than raw OpenSSL, something that, say, has database locking and has an OCSP responder written by people who actually write internet-facing demons routinely and are uh, uh, and who habitually write software that can withstand the internet. Uh, but I I would encourage you to do it at least once just to learn how all of this really fits together. Okay, what, what else have we got? Oh, yeah, more Acme, uh, KD server. Okay, T I have never used TLS with a storage server. So I would say one, check the documentation. Two, according to the standard, everything should take server alternative name. Uh, host name in CN has been deprecated for 21 years now. Here, here in where I live, the deprecation is now old enough to drink, vote, and get married. Uh, so hopefully, it you it recognizes server alternative name. Let's see, tested blog using SSL labs and got a single line, nothing really suspicious. I suspect uh, if, if nothing suspicious shows up in your log with SSL labs, I suspect that your SSL configuration was clean and not much made it to the server. Because I, I have spoken with people who had poor server configurations and uh, pointed SSL labs at their host and got warnings from intrusion detection, and some of them got blocked. Okay, we have some folks typing. I suppose. Do I have any experience with SNMP over TLS? Any future in that area? I played with it some while working on the SNMP book. Um... It works, it's fine, uh, it has a, it definitely has a, a higher overhead than just raw SNMP. I don't think that the industry is going to widely adopt it, uh, simply because every vendor seems to have their own SNMP replacement and wants it to become standard. So 
Uh, any thoughts on TLS and OpenVN, OpenVPN with a private CA? The, the, my main concern with these softwares that include a CA for generating, well, I'll, I'll pick on OpenVPN because it was mentioned. The documentation is great on getting you up and running. And it's not so great on how to renew the certificates. So be sure that you know how to renew certificates and maintain this CA over the long term uh, before you deploy it. I've talked with more than one person who tried to figure out how to renew certificates and wound up wiping out their existing CA and having to reissue everything in a hurry, which is, well, it is very secure because you know, getting rid of uh, the old private keys uh, reduces the, the attack surface, but it's certainly not convenient. Let's see. How does Quick compare with TLS? Oh. There are... <clears throat> I'm here at the front of the room and people are going to call me the expert on this. And I am, I have done some reading into it, but I think we have people better qualified to answer than me in the audience. So if you have a better answer, then please put it in the comments. Thank you. Yes, yes, you broke me. It's early. My caffeine hasn't kicked in. If I was actually in Vienna, you would see me with a uh, with a cup of tea in each hand, guzzling, hoping to be awake at some point. Isn't it too risky to place your certificates in one place? That's a uh, that's. Is it risky to have all of your certificates in, provided by one CA? Yes, it's also risky to have all of your certificates provided by multiple CAs. Choose your headache. Um, what I do find useful is... Um, or, or what I suspect will become useful are CAA records, which state which CAs may issue certificates for your zones. Let's see. Can TLS be used in peer-to-peer -peer environments? Is it a good idea? If you are willing to maintain your own CA and issue client certs all around, by all means do so. If I was to architect TLS from scratch, what would I do? I would become a truck driver. Okay, and we have an answer to quick versus TLS there. So...
technically the time slot is over, but I'm, I'm going to hang around for a bit. And after this, I'll be uh, hanging out in the, the chat room or, or the hallway track if you want to come by and talk. And yeah, there are there are many applications that use TLS for just one thing or another. And actually, if you're deploying something now, or if you're creating a protocol or an application, uh, starting right off with it only speaks TLS 1.3 is not a bad idea. Um, What do we have in store if security flaws are found in TLS 1.2 or 1.3? Well, 1.2, uh, the NSA has already said, please avoid these algorithms. So I think that we will find cracks there. And multiple cryptographers have told me that TLS 1.3 is the first version of TLS with a proper cryptographic design. It took a while to get actual cryptographers in the TLS design. So, uh, I, I suspect that TLS 1.3 is pretty solid but it does have room for extensions expansion and alteration so it, it from what i have read it's i, I don't want to call it future proof but they left some space for fixing problems okay i think that's about it thank you for attending <laughs>